What's going on, everybody? It is Triple Crown 24 back today. And over the weekend, I celebrated my four-year milestone as a sports card dealer. It's difficult to believe that it has been that long because it also feels like it's been a very short time that I've been doing this. But I wanted to make a video today to talk about four of my biggest takeaways from the first four years. This ties together a lot of things I've talked about on the channel before, but perhaps provide some stories to go along with them and some insights that I've picked up on how my mind has maybe changed over the years. And uh, let me just dive right into it, is that the very first thing, and I would say this is arguably the most important of the four that I have written down today, is that you want to value people over cards. And what do I mean by that is that the cards, I think, are secondary in a lot of cases. You always hear about the national. What's it about? It's about the people. It's about the experience. Of course, we want to get the cool cards and have all that. But at the same time, the people are, I think, what makes it special. And especially in these online communities that you see, whether it's here on YouTube or wherever else you may get your card content and interactions from, it's important to have that sense of community. So community over cards is a good way to put it. I tell you one story. I made a deal about four years ago at one of the first shows that I had set up at. It was a show where I said for sure I'm going to do this full time. And I was blessed to have the opportunity to set up next to some dealers who have been doing it for an extraordinarily long time. And not only have they done that, they've built up to kind of where I want to be one day, still to this day want to be one day. And they gave me a lot of good advice at that show, a lot of advice that I've taken. But one of the key things, just watching them interact with people, is that sometimes when they were really close on something, even if they didn't get their exact number, they would still take it or they would make the deal. Because it's kind of one of those in good faith type of things, right? Maybe it will lead to future deals. And that's not the only reason why they do it, right? You want to treat your customers with respect. You want to uh, provide customer service that allows them to feel like, hey, I want to come back to here. This is one of the first tables I want to go to next time I come to this show or see this person at a show. And that was vitally important for me because there are many times where I've made deals one way or the other where people have in good faith figure, you know, we're going to be making deals back and forth for a while. What's five or ten dollars here or there? And kind of the same thing. I had a deal like that this weekend where I made a trade for these four cards, Brees Hall, Retail Red SSP, Sean Taylor Downtown, Love the Downtowns, LT Rookie, and an Altuve Autograph. I got some cash too, but it was for a Herbert uh, Prism Rookie at a 249 Orange. And it was a guy who I've done deals with before. Herbert's his guy. He collects them. The only way that he gives up his Herbert's is if he can get, you know, kind of trade up into a better one or something that he values more. And look, we sat down and we talked and we talked through it, and he was fair with me. He kind of uh, he didn't expect me to kind of cave in on a point that he didn't cave in on, and that goes into it is that because we had made those deals before and we had those positive interactions, I don't necessarily know that it would have gone as smoothly or we would have gotten a deal done had those previous interactions not have been as pleasant. It kind of ties into this golden rule: treat others the way you want to be treated. I think that is vitally important for success at card shows. And it's going to tie into all four of my points, including number two here. You can't have your cake and eat it too. What do I mean by that? Well, I'll give you a really good example is that I made a very large purchase over the weekend. And two of the big cards are two that I normally wouldn't target. This one I would because I like this guy a lot. Micah Parsons. This is a purple pulsar. It's numbered out of 21. This is definitely not something I would normally buy. I love my downtowns, but this is a little bit beyond uh, something I would like to quote unquote gamble on. It's a Kyle Pitts gold tight, uh, not tight end. <laughs> he is a tight end here on National Tight End Day, but it's a gold out of 10. And those were the two big cards in the deal. I also got a large stack of Pokemon, but I overheard this dealer who was telling me, or telling, I guess, someone else at his table that, you know, if we're going to trade, it's going to be kind of, it's going to be fair on both sides. And what, what he meant by that is that if you have one of these guys that are coming up and like, well, the last comp is this, that if you try to turn that around and do it to their cards, they say, oh, well, 
you're not taking this into consideration. It's not equal. And that's kind of the way that I run it too. Like, look, if you want to go directly based on the last sale and take nothing else into context, okay, I'm probably not going to make that deal, but I will still consider it. But it can't go both ways where all of a sudden we have to take into context for your cards or we're going to average out sales for your cards, right? That's not how it works. It's not fair uh, really for both sides because if you flipped the script a little bit and you were on the other side of the table, kind of think about how you would feel if you were the dealer and you're trying to do this as well, right? And that's kind of one of the things that I've learned even through like interactions on social media, Instagram, Discord, Twitter, whatever the case may be, is there's a lot of times that I'll see that where people will get upset that I'm only willing to pay 60% of the last sale. And the reason for that is just because sometimes I don't believe in a card or I don't think it's going to generate what it got last time up. For example, I have a card right here somewhere at the bottom of my stack. This is a Pokemon card here, and I couldn't tell you really much about it other than I think it looks cool. It's a Rayquaza card, and I believe it was this card where the last sale was 77, but before that it was 125 and then 150. And I'll tell you what I didn't do when I built my stack together and I valued it out. I didn't value it at 77 because that was the last deal. I took an average for it. That's because the dealer did the same thing with me. When we were working on a trade for a card earlier in the day, he had the card that I wanted. He looked at my stuff and he took me, you know, he, he treated his card the exact same way that he treated mine. He said, you know, we'll go last sale for last sale on this. And I said, that's fine with me because I was happy with what I got and he was happy with what he got. You know, I think it was fair for both sides. And he even said to me again, I have a feeling we're going to cross paths again. So we'll get off on the right foot here and make this deal happen. And that that kind of ties into what I'm saying, right? You can't have your cake and eat it too. I've already tried to sell this card, and I can't tell you how many times already I've had people try to offer me maybe 25% off of what it last sold for. But I know that these very same people, when I've done that, on their, if I did that on their cards or when I have done that on their cards, it's, oh, no, 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 that, that can't happen. So I get it. They're different cards, different contexts, right? But when it's always that way, but it's always, it, it's always kind of an unbalanced thing. It's not like this is just a one-off type of deal. Just something that I've picked up on. You, you got to play it fair if you want to get far. And that kind of goes as a... Uh, as a buyer to it shows I've found like, look, if you want to complain about dealers overpricing cards at the same time, I hear a lot of these same people complaining at, Oh, this dealer will only offer me 70%. Well, if you're only willing to pay 80% of what the last sale was, why would it make sense for a, de a dealer to be paying hundred percent of what your thing is worth or 200% is what I'm usually used to. You just can't have it both ways. It's, it's one of those things where if you want to play it based off of, oh, I got to be below whatever the last eBay sale is, sure, go ahead. But there are also ramifications for that as well. It's You can't sit on both sides of the fence. The third thing is to, that I trust my instincts over comps. <laughs> and what do I mean by that? I'm not a comp hater, all right? I know I've, I've probably use the term in a very negative light more often than not in fact most of the time i am but the fact of the matter is is that i'm using it dozens of times a day it, it could be for evaluating my own cards it could be for evaluating cards that i'm looking to purchase it could just be for evaluating cards that i particularly have my eye on or just monitoring something that i'm curious about that maybe i want to look into a little bit more or i want to look into in the future or even in hindsight, kind of look back, like, was I right about selling this at the right time? W was that the correct decision? Kind of evaluating my decision-making process and being able to fine-tune it. But instinctually now, I've gotten to the point where I really don't, if I'm at a show or something, bust out my phone to check out a price unless I really am concerned about 
something or I really want to see maybe some patterns overall. I'm not just looking for whatever the last sale was. I'm looking for my instincts and to kind of tell me what does my gut say this thing is worth? What do I think I can get for it as well? Because that's ultimately the goal of what I'm going for. And I'll give you a good example of that is I bought a Kirk Cousins card that last sold for $26 in this exact same grade that I bought it for. Uh, and that was sometime over the summer. I can't tell you exactly when. I think maybe in June. And I paid $65 shipped for it here. And you might think, well, that's stupid. Why would you pay two and a half times what the last one sold for? It's because I don't think it's really a $26 card. I think that that number is an outlier. And it's a card number to 57. I'll tell you straight up what it is. It's a Topps Black from his rookie year. I love the Topps Gold and Black flagship parallels. And back when they did football, Gold and Black, the same thing. It was the number of years that they had put out Topps football in 2012. That was 57 years. They're out of 57. And cards like that, they just don't come along too often. Where if I solely base it off of whatever the last number is, I'm not going to get very far. Now, I will say that this guy did have this card listed for $200. And when I saw that it had last gone for $26, am I going to pay 10 times what it last went for? No, I'm not going to do that. But I still don't think that that 26 number is accurate. I told him, like, hey, look, I'm not going to offer you less than what this number is. I think it's worth more. Here's where I'd be comfortable at. And we went back and forth a little bit. And sure enough, it ended up working out where we found a middle ground there. And being able to trust my instinct, we'll see how it's going to be one of those time will tell things. Am I going to be dead wrong about that card? Possibly. But a lot of the stuff I buy, I can't tell you the last time I lost several hundred dollars on a deal because it just, I don't buy a lot of stuff where I have that big of a, a swing where I could be really risking a lot there. It's one of those things where it's more so where am I going to uh, kind of what my floor is? And I try not to go too far beneath that floor if you're picking up on what I'm putting down there. And yeah, I would, on a card like a Kirk Cousins, when he said it was 200, it piqued my interest because it's just a card that doesn't come up too often. So I wanted to double check it. But say something like this, for example. I did not have to look this one up. This is a Travis Kelsey optic card out of gold. He's a very hot name in the hobby right now for reasons that you and I all know. And the dealer had this one stickered at $90. And to me, that seemed about right. But I figured if I bundled it together and I was able to talk him down a little bit, I would be able to get this card at a price where I would definitely be very confident in it and be confident in saying like, okay, I think that I can get that for it. And on top of that, you kind of have to trust your instincts sometimes on certain cards. Here's another one that I've recently picked up. It's a Torkelson 101. And my Tigers bias might be coming in here a little bit. But this is from 2021 Bowman Transcendent Collection. I didn't know this until it had already arrived. But uh, this card has actually been graded twice and cracked out. I believe one time it was a BGS... Eight, and then one time it was an SGC eight five, so it's been it's been in some different slabs that I currently have it as I received it raw, and I put it into this magnetic holder here. But it's a one of one, and the dealer, or the, I guess I should say the seller. I don't know if it's necessarily a dealer, but the person I bought it from when they posted it up for sale. They had it at a price where it was right around what spot price was to buy into one of these breaks. And when I take that into context, that's usually something that I'll raise an eyebrow at. Like, this is a, if you hit this card in a break, I feel like you would be pretty happy <laughs> because transcendent breaks usually you come out behind. Uh, there's some very top heavy spots, but usually it's probably a couple hundred dollar loss. In my experience, I think I've done maybe four transcendent breaks in my life. And I'm batting about 500 on them. Two times I came out behind and two times I came out ahead, which is above average, I would say, for those breaks. But I was able to talk him down a little bit more. And now I have this card. And I'm into it at a number that I'm very comfortable with. And it's one of those things, too, where people can take a look at what it might have sold for in the past when it was graded. 
but it's a one of one. And yeah, there's a lot of one of ones out there. It's something that isn't as special as it used to be, but I feel that I currently have it priced at a number that is not ridiculous. I think it's reasonable. And eventually if I have to come down on it, okay, that's fine. But it's an opportunity. It's a risk. And you do have to take some risks. The last part is not as tied into this stuff, but I think you can make some parallels between it. It does tie into that golden rule thing. And that organization and presentation are a lot more important than you might think. A question that I got over the weekend was, JT, do you price all of your cards for all of your shows? And the answer is yes. The only time you're going to see something in my showcase and it's not priced as if I picked it up that day. And typically, unless I'm running low or I have something that I really think I need to put out because I think it will sell at that show that I'm currently at, that's not going to happen. And the reason that I do that is because I don't want there to be any guesswork. I There's a lot of times where people will look at a card on my table, they'll go step aside, and they'll type it in their phone, and they'll look it up, and then they'll come back if they, if they think that they can make an offer on it, and then they'll go away, they might come back again. But I don't want them to keep leaving and coming back, because every time that that happens, they're less likely to come back, in my experience. When someone says, I'll be back nine times out of ten, they will not be back. And it's not because they're being disingenuous or anything. They might forget. Maybe they blow their entire budget for the day at the next table over. Maybe something comes up where they got to go. They've got another engagement to get to, whatever the case may be. But keeping things organized with my prices and I keep track of what I'm into certain things at, I try to present my showcases nice and clean where you can get a general idea of where things are. So if I have multiple cards of the same player, I'm going to try to put them next to each other. If I have multiple cards of the same team, keep those bunched together. I don't want to put my Bowman stuff with my vintage Hall of Famers because the markets for those two things are very different. And my target audiences for those two things are also very different. I'm going to put certain things towards the front of the showcases, usually that I think more so appeal to a younger audience because, well, they're shorter, they can easier see in the front of the showcase. Same thing at a grocery store. Why do you think a lot of the sugary breakfast cereals are at the bottom shelves? Think about it. And because of that, I think that has given me a little bit of an edge because there are a lot of people who set up at shows. There's a lot of competition to get into certain shows. And especially when you're in a recession or a tighter economy, a down market, all these factors. I'm kind of saying the same things in different ways, but you get the point. You have to do something to stand out, and people are not necessarily obligated to buy at a lot of these shows. I know that I don't want to go to a show and not buy something, ideally. <laughs> I feel that I want to make the most out of a show and try to get as many deals done as I can without overextending or making a poor deal just for this for the sake of saying hey i made one or for the sake of making content you don't want to do that <laughs> but at the same time i want to be able to go out there and make these deals and one of the biggest turnoffs for me is to walk up to a table that is not organized where there's absolutely nothing priced and having to wait use up show floor time for someone to look something up now, if you have it written down behind the table, you know, I could see that too. I've experimented with that before where I've had like a spreadsheet that I would lay out with my prices instead of putting them directly on the cards. But overall, I just like to put them on the cards. Everything is in a sleeve and a top loader and a protective team bag of some sort. And I just use my little label maker. If I had a card handy that had one of my little labels on it, here's one right here that I recently sold. Derek Henry downtown, you can see. You got my sticker right there on it. And yeah, makes it easier. People don't have to kind of guess on certain things, but also they kind of know where to find certain things as well. They kind of can know what to expect with me, even though I'm turning things over a lot. For example, I'm going to have probably two dozen Pokemon cards at the next show I set up that. That's not normal for me. Maybe I have eight to ten and kind of moving on up. That's a little bit different, but overall, you know what you're going to be getting from me. 
and you kind of know where I'm going to price things and which things I'm going to value a little bit more and which things I'm going to value a little bit less. But generally speaking, overall, I think that all four of these things that I have told you are not specific to anything. You don't have to focus on ultra modern football and you don't have to focus on non-sports. You don't have to do expensive cards, cheap cards, whatever the case may be. I think all four of these things, no matter which hat or hats you want to wear as a dealer, if you do these four things, it will help you because these are four things that have tremendously helped me and four things that I carry with me as I continue on here beyond this four-year mark. So thank you very much for watching. And again, thank you for all the support over the four years that I've been a dealer and anyone who was along for the ride before I even chose this crazy path for myself. It is greatly appreciated. I'll be sure to see you soon with more content. Until then, take care, stay safe, be kind.